An appropriate question on the show this week. How do we heat our homes in a climate-friendly way? Hydrogen or electricity? The debate's, well, heating up. Welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. This week we're in Ellesmere Port, beside, as you can see, this huge refinery, a symbol of our fossil fuel past, well, and present too. But just around the corner is a neighbourhood that could be pointing the way to a cleaner future, still based on gas, but hydrogen gas. But as we'll see, not everyone's happy. And also in the show, as the cold snap forces Britain into using coal power stations this week, are we really close to becoming coal-free? And we'll hear from the trailblazing woman training young Africans in green tech. But first, to a corner of Cheshire that's becoming a test bed for the move from natural gas to hydrogen. Are the residents happy to be guinea pigs? And is hydrogen appropriate for homes anyway? Let's find out. This is Stanlow Refinery. It produces billions of litres of petrol, diesel and jet fuel a year. And the idea is to retool this place to produce hydrogen as well. Because some hope hydrogen can replace natural gas as the standard fuel in our homes. What do you use gas for in, in your home? Just about everything. Heating, cooking, hot water. How important is it? It's essential. Can't live without it, especially in this weather. Three quarters of homes in the UK are dependent on gas for heating. But when it's burnt, it releases carbon dioxide. Decarbonising our homes is essential if we're going to reach net zero. Natural gas is methane. Its chemical formula is CH4. The C is carbon. Hydrogen gas is just H2. There is no carbon. Given that hydrogen can run in pipes, boilers and cookers, some people think it's almost an oven-ready replacement for gas. There will be no real change for people who are currently used to using natural gas. The housing stock will be populated with what are known as hydrogen-ready boilers. So that is a boiler that can use natural gas currently and at the point of conversion can be converted in situ in someone's home and according to uh, the government, will be done in under two hours, and then they just are using natural gas in the uh, using hydrogen in the same way as they're using natural gas. To test that idea, a so-called hydrogen village is proposed just round the corner from that big refinery, complete with a hydrogen experience centre to show people how hydrogen works in the home. Previous projects have shown that only small changes are needed to gas pipes and our homes in order to start using this more sustainable gas. What do the residents think? Well, some of them are not too keen. I think it's ridiculous. Hydrogen, with all the risk reduction measures, will still result in three times as many fires or explosions in the house than natural gas. The consensus of independent analysts is that hydrogen will be at least two to five times the price of natural gas dependent on the manufacturing method and it's too inefficient. Keith and many other residents are unhappy. The proposal is for around 2,000 homes in this area to be cut off from natural gas. Are you being a bit of a stick in the mud? I don't think so, no. Our, our homes, our properties, our families have been offered on a plate to the oil and gas industry to experiment in. Many locals here resent being part of what they see as an imposed real-world experiment. But Cadent, who are running the trial, told us they will continue to engage with residents. I've had several hundred uh, people contact me to say that they are against it. I've had a few people contact me to say they're in favour of it. And of course, we know that actually there's about 2,000 homes affected. So there are a large number of people in the middle who haven't uh, spoken up at all. This unease about using hydrogen in our homes is not just local nimbyism. Many energy experts think home energy is just not a smart use of hydrogen. The only low carbon, zero carbon form of hydrogen is green hydrogen, and that's made from electricity. And you need an awful lot of electricity to make green hydrogen and then turn that back into heat uh, in a hydrogen boiler. 
when you compare that to other options, you know, where you use the electricity directly rather than converting it to hydrogen and back into heat using a heat pump, you're actually getting a much higher efficiency and you're saving yourself an awful lot of that energy that you need for the hydrogen route. Heat pumps use electricity to draw air from the outside and turn it into warm air for your home. Here in Worcestershire, they're being fitted to a new development of 55 homes with no connection to the gas grid. We've got to face the fact that we've all got to try to be more ecologically friendly and we've got to try to reduce the costs of running our houses, and etc. So the whole package of great insulation, a modern heating system, is obviously going to make, mean that we can sell the house, if we ever need to, much quicker than if we're selling it with a, a gas boiler. These heat pumps are going into new homes. Retrofitting them is often more disruptive than switching from natural gas to hydrogen. That is one of the main arguments from the gas network company Cadent, who run the Hydrogen Experience Centre with British Gas. They decided late on not to speak to us, but home hydrogen still has its supporters. The efficiency argument is important, Tom. We can't argue with that. But it's not the only factor that's important. What's important is the overall economic cost, and importantly, the cost of the consumer in all this. But Cadence runs some of the gas network. British Gas is a gas company. It's in their interest to back hydrogen. Well, not at all, Tom. The members of my trade association make heat pumps, they make heat interface units for heat networks, and they make hydrogen ready boilers and currently gas boilers. So for many of our members, actually making a heat pump, you know, if that's what they have to do, they're manufacturers. That's what they'll do. But to suggest that we're only interested in this because, um, you know, it's in our financial or commercial interest is absolutely the wrong thing. Gas is a key part of our home energy ecosystem. Making a clean break is painful. I've returned from Ellesmere Port and I'm in Sky News kind of energy switching centre. This is really the nerve centre of electricity for this place. And I'm with David Joffe from the Climate Change Committee, which advises government on policy in this area. David, simple question in a way, hydrogen right for homes or not right for homes? Our assessment is that using a lot of hydrogen for homes is not going to work because we simply won't have enough energy that we can produce in the UK. We're going to be very import dependent if we use a lot of hydrogen and that won't be good for us. It will be expensive as well. When you say a lot, I mean, are you really saying that there might be a tiny minority of houses, but on the whole, no? Is that more or less it? <laughs> Our position is that wherever you can use electrified solutions, that includes heat pumps but not limited to heat pumps, that's the best thing to do. And then where you can't do that, where that's not feasible, where it's too expensive, then yes, we could use hydrogen. But you've had a report out this week that's looked at energy supply. Where do you see hydrogen fitting in? So used for a variety of things, and it is an important solution. It is an important part of net zero. We just shouldn't be trying to do everything with it. So what we need to use it for is low carbon industry to decarbonize that. We think there's a really important role for that. For example, high temperature heat in industry where there's very few ways of doing that in a low carbon way. So things like steel, but other things as well? Like steel, but other things as well. Uh, ceramics, for example, those sorts of things where we need high temperatures. So that's an important thing. Also a really important role in backing up our renewable based electricity system. So we're, we're going to need to have an electricity system that's fully decarbonized by 2035 using a range of technologies, but mostly in terms of electricity generation, things like offshore wind, like solar generation, onshore wind and nuclear. Now there'll be times when the wind isn't blowing that much and we'll need to fill in those gaps and hydrogen fired power stations is a good way of doing that. So we think that's an important solution. So when the wind is blowing a lot and we're not using a lot of energy actually in our homes or businesses, you make hydrogen then, yes. basically, and then put it in some kind of storage tank, some kind of compression? Absolutely. Right? So we think, that, as you say, there will be times where there are surpluses of wind generation. We can produce the hydrogen there and we can store it in things called salt caverns, which are geological uh, facilities to store the hydrogen and we can take it out when we need it, put it back through a power plant and generate the electricity when we need it. What about the government's performance overall on, on decarbonising its electricity, our uh, power generation system? Uh, not really quite going fast enough, not up to speed? We've reduced emissions from electricity generation by 70% over the last decade. That's really good. But looking forward, 
We need to be building the storage facilities of electricity storage and hydrogen storage. We need to be expanding the network, the electricity transmission, and building new hydrogen pipelines. And those bits are not going fast enough. So not on target to hit our targets for 2035? Not yet, no. We still think it's within reach. And we made the recommendation to, for the 2035 date in 2020. The government accepted it in 2021. But that's 18 months ago. And we haven't yet seen a plan from the government about how the overall 2035 target is going to be achieved. Thanks very much indeed, David. Well, this week did see the unwelcome return of something from our fossil fuel past, and that was the switching on of a coal-fired power station for the first time this winter because of a cold snap. So while this does raise some questions about our ability to get off coal, Simon Evans from Carbon Brief tells us it's not all bad news. I'm Dr Simon Evans, the Senior Policy Editor at Carbon Brief. Earlier this week we published new analysis showing that UK greenhouse gas emissions were 3.4% lower in 2022 than a year earlier, thanks to above average temperatures and a surge in clean energy. That means that the UK's emissions are now 49% below 1990 levels, in other words halfway to meeting the target of net zero by 2050. Now one of the most striking findings in our analysis was that UK coal use fell by another 15% last year. In fact, it's now so low, it's the lowest it's been since 1757, 266 years ago. In 1757, King George II was on the throne and Mozart was still in nappies. I think that's really interesting finding because it's actually completely contrary to a lot of the headlines we've been seeing over the past year about the UK turning back to coal in, in light of the global energy crisis. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, our analysis shows that, that far from turning back to coal, the UK is, is turning away from coal so hard it's the lowest it's been since before the Industrial Revolution. The only problem with this is that we've cut coal so quickly, and that's one of the reasons why UK emissions have fallen so fast over the past decade, but there's now hardly any coal left to cut. If the UK wants to meet its target of net zero by 2050, that means it now has to turn beyond coal and start cutting emissions from oil and gas as well. Now to a place where the progress to a decarbonised future is pretty much unarguable, and that's the town of Sonderburg in Denmark. They've done so well in decarbonising that the International Energy Agency has called them the energy efficiency capital of the world. Well, here's Brian Seberg from their Project Zero to tell us how they've done it. Hello. My name is Brian Seberg. I'm the CEO of Project Zero. This is my city. This is the city of Sønderborg, located in the southern part of Denmark. Today, I will show you why my city is named the global capital of energy efficiency. Just have a look at this supermarket. It helps us to save a lot of energy by reusing excess heat from cooling displays and freezers. And they are selling excess heat to homes and companies through the local district heating grid. So we are sharing, we're producing electricity and then we are converting it to heat. We are converting it to fuels in a sustainable manner and in an efficient manner. One of the ways we do that, for instance, to provide heat is with heat pumps. And that is not only to heat our house, but it could be high temperature heat for processes in industry. Danfoss has been one of the main businesses in the region contributing to Project Zero with technology and solutions to reduce energy demand and to reuse energy already produced. The factory site has now become a part of the local district heating grid, providing lower energy prices for the local community. In Sønderborg, we reuse excess heat from data centers to heat our homes and office space. Carbon emissions from space heating and hot domestic water have been reduced by 73%. Sonderburg is a pretty inspiring place. When you look at our settlements here, it shows you how far we have to go to approach those levels of energy efficiency. Now, coming up after the break, 
As the world marked International Women's Day this week, we hear from the inspiring leader who's training young African women to get into green tech. I speak to one of the UK's negotiators involved in agreeing a defining new treaty to protect our oceans. And shopping in the endangered isle, how climate change could threaten some of our supermarket staples. Welcome back to the show. Well, to mark International Women's Day that was earlier this week, we've got a great film from a woman who's helping other women while also fighting the climate crisis. Astria Fataki sent us this from Togo. Hi, I'm Astria Fataki and I'm the founder of Energy Generation. Energy Generation is a pan-African organization that is based in Lome, Togo, and that aims to train young Africans, and especially young women, to become entrepreneurs in the field of clean energy, healthcare, and agribusiness. And I said especially young women because when I founded Energy Generation seven years ago, I did it because I wanted to contribute to changing the narrative of the continent. And as I move along in this journey, I realized that women were actually the best storyteller uh, to tell the story of this beautiful and vibrant continent. But of course, not only telling the story, also writing it. Uh, women are powerful change maker in their ecosystem, and yet uh, they are not always valued uh, as much as they should be. There have been some improvement, but there is still so much to do. And for me, one of the key ways to empower women so that they can write the story, uh, the new story of the continent and build the future of the continent is to empower them through education, support, uh, by giving them the tools so that they can become the hero of their own story because they do have the potential to do so. Well, this week brought news of a new international treaty being agreed to protect a large proportion of what's called the high seas. That's the bit outside of national jurisdiction and it could be very, very important for our marine life. And I'm joined by Alan Evans who was at the heart of the UK team. Alan, why is this important? It truly was a momentous moment in the governance of the world's ocean. What the new treaty is now providing is some measures, is some, a framework that now enables states to actually establish, for example, marine protected areas beyond areas of national jurisdiction. It provides them with a governance structure that will enable them to regulate better should any industry move offshore into areas of the high sea. Well, this is quite interesting you mentioned industry because one of the things I've heard is this is partly about the genetic resources of what lies on the seabed. I mean, I think people talked about some of the creatures there being relevant in some of the drugs we produce and in the future we need to protect them, make sure the right people get rewarded and the, and the creatures themselves get protected. Is this the kind of thing? What the new treaty now provides is a mechanism where any monetary benefits that could be recognised through the exploitation of marine genetic resources collected in the high seas, that that revenue is now shared equally with the greater good, with okay. other member states. So if I'm a company that finds, I don't know, some, some sponge or some, you know, jellyfish is, provides the, the cure for something or other that makes me billions, I've got to share that out uh, in, in the international good? That's correct, yes, because no state has sovereign rights to the resources of the high seas until now where all states effectively have part ownership so what did the agreement moment feel like? Uh, truly momentous. I mean, it had been, you know, a tough, tough four and a half years of negotiating, but it was the end of a journey which took two, four and a half years to get there, and the last two weeks was, you know, in particular, very intense. Yeah, a great sense of joy and relief at the end. Um, is it just about, if you like, genetic resources, or could it help to actually protect you know, fisheries and wildlife more widely in the ocean? It certainly can help protect. I mean, the, the ability now to establish marine protected areas, that there is a target by many to establish 30% of the world ocean as protected areas by 2030. Now that is a big ask. And this helps with that, does it? This certainly helps with that. How will it be policed or enforced, if you like? 
The details of how that will be done are yet to be determined, but there will be a need for the use of you know, innovative technologies to, to make sure... Tracking that... vessels and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this already happens for where areas within national jurisdiction on, yeah. you know, in vast ocean areas have already been established. This already happens. We often hear about the seas being in peril and we've got the, the ocean rescue here. Are the oceans now better protected after this agreement? M most certainly. I mean, g given the ability to establish more protected areas, given the ability under the new treaty to ensure that should new industries develop offshore, there is an environmental impact assessment process now. And should that EIA show that there might be some damage to the marine environment through whatever activity is being proposed, well, states will have a right to stop that activity taking place. Thanks very much, Alan. Now, to a supermarket like no other, we've been shopping in the endangered aisle, as the fair trade organisation says that many of the products we love could be in peril at a time of climate change. As you walk in, you see empty shelves, and those shelves could be very much what we could see in the future if we don't act now. And we've already been seeing it recently with uh, the shelves in supermarkets being emptied of salad products. Well, it's a very real fact that if we carry on like this in the future, we might not see cocoa, bananas, and coffee on the shelves. Almost half of the uh, banana imports that come into the UK come from countries where there are devastating climate challenges happening, such as floods, such as droughts, hurricanes, and really high temperatures. 90% of coffee farmers are saying that they are already being severely impacted by climate change. My name is Nimrod Wambete. I am a smallholder farmer from Uganda on the slopes of a great mountain, Mount Elegon. We are growing uh, coffee, but the, the, the volumes are under threat because of climate change. The coffee I grow has migrated from the altitude it used to grow, and it's going up in search of temperatures where it can survive, leaving the farmers vulnerable with very, very struggling coffee. Our incomes alone from coffee are not enough to, to, to help us uh, adapt and to confront this climate uh, monster. We know that the public really wants to make a difference. They want to be able to help and support. So by making a small change, they can protect the future of the food and be not paying too high prices or see empty shelves in the future. A great illustration there how both farmers and consumers are impacted by climate change, but also how we might have to adapt to it. Now, just a reminder that you can catch up with the Daily Climate Show weekdays on Sky News at 3.30. And you can also get all the latest climate and environmental news on the Sky News website or app or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. That's it from Cheshire. See you for the show again next week.